Hey, thank you so much for joining us for Sales and Marketing Game Changers. This is part two of our month-long event. We're going to show up here every Thursday, the same time, same bat channel, to bring you huge value to help you move the needle with your sales and marketing. Because let's face it, nothing is what it was five months ago. And everybody could use a little help, a little support. So these five gentlemen have agreed to jump on this crazy bandwagon with me and bring this event to you live. And it seems that they had a lapse in judgment <clears throat> because they've handed over the mic and put me in charge today. So, <laughs> Well, you got the short straw, Allison. You didn't That's know right. that, that everybody else voted and you got the short straw. Fair, fair. <laughs> I'll ride. So hold on to your seat. Um, so I want to do some quick intros. We're going to go around the room and uh, just tell people listening who you are, what you do. We will start with uh, Ben. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Baker. My company is Your Brand Marketing. And what we do is something called Podcast Host for Hire. We help companies create, host, produce, and you know, basically help them shine by creating their own custom podcast. It's a done-for-you system. What we do is we are the people that drive the bus and help you communicate your brand effectively and great, get some great content. Awesome. Ray? Hey, everybody. Ray Giganto. I'm the manufacturing unicorn from Lenara International. And what I do is bring my passion for manufacturing to your company, link it up to your dream, and we get stuff done. Front door to back door, whatever and wherever you need your company to go. I can help you get it there, and we're going to have some fun doing it. So, so glad to be with everybody today. And Mark Roberts. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Roberts. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of OTB Solutions. And what we do is we help you grow your sales profitably. And what makes us a little unique is we use data to do it. So I look forward to participating today. All right, Chris. All right. My name is Chris Lukey by day. I'm an account manager at Rockwell Automation, largest company in the world dedicated to industrial automation. Essentially what I do is I help manufacturers bring their digital transformation uh, objectives to life. But by night, I'm a podcaster in the manufacturing space, host of the show Manufacturing Happy Hour, where we take on the latest trends in technology in that industry, uh, preferably over a cold one when we can. <laughs> and last but not least, our wizard. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Mitchell from uh, Wizard Strategy. Uh, I'm a uh, sales and marketing consultant to building material companies. Uh, and my focus is on the channel. So how do you motivate architects, contractors, builders, dealers, distributors, or big box buyers um, to uh, want and prefer your product. And that's the area that I, that I specialize in. And um, uh, so I, I, I really like this group because there's people from outside the industry that I'm also learning a lot from. So I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts, but also from learning from all of you. Absolutely. And uh, you bring up a good point. I have learned more from these five gentlemen in a very short period of time. Um, and that's why I knew that bringing all of this expertise together in one area would bring tremendous value to anybody that wants to take the time to listen. So just really quick, uh, I'm Allison DeFord. I'm the resident trailblazer and founder at Felt Marketing. We are the only marketing retrofit company for manufacturers. And we help you get to the heart of your ideal customer and make sales easier with our proven process. I'm also the co-host with Mr. Zaganto here of a little podcast called MFG Out Loud, where we have courageous conversations about sales and marketing for manufacturers. So tune in if you are interested in that. We will help you, um, again, move the needle with some big conversations. So really quick, last week, <clears throat> in case any of you missed it, we did part one where we had courageous conversations about modifying your marketing so that you're not just seen and heard, you're felt, right? You're resonating on an emotional level with your customers. It makes it so much easier when the value is clear, the decision is easy. So in case you missed that episode, you can find it here on this YouTube channel and also on each of our 
um, company sites. And so look us up on LinkedIn. We are there for you. And uh, you can catch part one. The feedback was amazing. Was it not? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Everything I wrote, you know, was was amazing. You know, that self promotion was just incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like your stuff too. <laughs> oh well, the the thing that we want everyone listening to know is that we are you. We are just like you. Our markets, our buyers, um, our own companies have experienced disruption, unlike nothing we've ever seen in our lifetime, and. We want to help you strategically pivot. I know everyone's tired of that word, but you can't get away from it, right? And, and to modify your strategy, improve your skills, and not just survive this, but thrive. Because there's a huge distinction between the two. Um, so that's what today's conversation is all about. We want to help you stop selling naked. Thank you, Mark Roberts. Um, and, and use data to do that, right? To really leverage that. So many people say that they have analytics, say that, yeah, yeah, we check the data, but they're not really using it to their advantage, right? So we're gonna help you do that. And, uh, and as Mark says, there are dollars in the data. I love that. So Game Changer friends, we're gonna help you cash in and <clears throat> let's get started. We've got um, just a couple of questions today. Some of them from our listeners. So we're excited to answer your burning questions, not just our own. Um, the result of the last five months has left <clears throat> many companies selling naked, right? Like the Warren Buffett quote, weakness is exposed. So how do you know if you're selling naked? And I'm thinking we let Mark Roberts kick us off and the others can chime in because he's the selling naked dude. So. How do you know? That'll be my claim to fame, huh? Um, well, the first thing you're going to notice is sales is either stalled or declining. And then you take a look at the sales that you are getting and all of a sudden, you know, people are making compromises on price, which is hurting margin, which ultimately hurts your net income. Um, but also listen, you know, listen to what buyers are saying online. Um, if you're not listening to social networks, um, I recommend that you start right away. And it can be as simple as creating a Google alert uh, about your company. Um, but yeah, what we're finding is um, people are trying to sell like they've always sold for 10, 15, even five years. And it's not working. And they're seeing their salespeople frustrated. Uh, accounts are getting frustrated. And we need to adapt. So... That's kind of how you can tell if you're selling naked. If all of a sudden you start seeing symptoms, like your salespeople are getting really burned out, they don't have really strong pipelines, you don't have a nice um, strong sales to quota, you're starting to see revenue drop, something's off. And high probability is they're using the wrong value proposition, poor messaging, and they're probably leading with things that are no longer resonating with their buyer. Well, one thing that you've mentioned before is <clears throat> another way to tell if you're selling naked is your salespeople are, first of all, not trained in selling virtually, and you've got some great statistics on that, and also you're busy playing features and benefits bingo. Right. And what you can do is, if you're in sales or if you're with a salesperson or listening on a call, what percent of the call did the customer speak compared to your salesperson? And then that is a pretty disturbing statistic. Over 50% of salespeople have not received any skills training. So they're definitely selling naked right now. Uh, they're doing feature and benefit bingo. If you haven't heard that phrase, what they're doing is they're just showing up and throwing up until the buyer jumps up and goes, yep, I get it, bingo. I know what you do for me. Um, that never happens. Um, so what we need to do is right now, about 60% of salespeople based on the assessment tool um, that I use are struggling selling virtually. Uh, they, they're struggling working remotely. So if we don't have a plan to help train them, then we're not going to be very happy in the next, in the future months. Absolutely. Um, anybody want to chime in there? Yeah, I, I got, got some really good thoughts on that. The challenge is, is that, and you're absolutely right, Mike, is, is that salespeople aren't trained. When I started off selling 30 years ago, 
you didn't go out in the field without somebody that was mentoring you. You know, you had six months of somebody that was trailing you around that was there to answer questions, was there to help you through the process that was getting an override on whatever you sold and would allow you to be better. And that just doesn't happen anymore. And we don't spend the money on training salespeople. The assumption is, oh yeah, sales, how difficult could it be? Just give them some business cards and a phone and just let them go out there. And it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, but it's a matter of looking at it going, you know what? We need to realize that sales is a skill like everything else, and you can always get better. And companies need to realize that their salespeople need to learn how to listen. They need to learn how to be inquisitive. They need to learn how to use the tools to find out what's really going on in business out there because our clients come to us 70% of the way through the journey. They've already gone on our social media feeds. They've already looked at our commercials. They've already gone through our, our website and they've crawled through it. They've talked to people that they know. They've talked to people that they don't know. And they've decided, okay, maybe this is right for me. And by the time they get to you, they want somebody to help them facilitate the process. They could care less about features and benefits at that point in time because they already know. They probably know more than the salesperson they're talking to. They just need somebody who can sit there and say, how is this going to work for me? And how is this going to make me better? And we need to train our salespeople how to do that because Mark, you're absolutely right. You know, the majority of salespeople out there don't have a clue. Yeah. Ray. I was, uh, one of the things Mark brought up uh, as, as far as some of the, some of the metrics, if you're tracking anything, especially right now, you're probably seeing this big disconnect between well, what we used to track in the past, you know, isn't working more. And the initial instinct is, well, double down. Well, you need to be making more calls, send out more emails, you know, those types of things. And especially today, based, Ben, based on what you said and how that journey, uh, how our customers go through that, uh, go through that journey, the reality is stop tracking activity and start tracking outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, is really what we're looking at. And Mark Roberts, that's, that's what you had pointed out, you know, per, percent to quote it you know everything's got to translate into a a sales dollar at some point and and you're right the world changed you know five months ago i know we, we don't want to say pivot um you know today's euphemism might be how do we step over that pile of crap you know that we've that, that's that's landed on us uh but uh, it, you know it, absolutely it's it's different and you've you've got to the, this the old tools don't work anymore they, they just don't the world changed hmm. Mark Mitchell. Yes, I, uh, I've uh, also written uh, about this. Uh, um, I have a blog post on selling naked as well. And what, what I find is um, I ride along, before coronavirus, I would ride along with salespeople. Now I tune into their virtual sales calls. And I consistently see where they literally, I feel, I feel, um, I don't know what word here, sorry for the salespeople. <laughs> Literally, like they they were hired, they were trained in product. Why are products better? And maybe coached by, you know, uh, an uh, an existing salesperson who maybe, you know, certainly has their built-in biases and and their mindset of how to do things. They're kind of locked into that, which may be ten years old of how you've done things. So they're not trained one in the customer. Um, or, um, and so they, they walk in and they start in, well, our company's this big, we've been around this many years, we this, we this. And I, I literally watch the eyeballs of the, uh, you know, the, um, customers and they're, they're kind of like, yeah, yeah. Okay. They're, they're literally tuned out now and they're waiting till maybe something gets said. And sometimes they're actually trying to help the salesman. There's something you must have that's of interest to me. Okay. Like to, to Mark's feature benefit bingo. I've seen actually where it actually has worked, you know, but it's 20 minutes of wasted time into the presentation where they say, Oh, by the way, we have this new angled thing that fixes this problem with floors. And the guys you do. Oh my God. Okay. And, and so they don't understand. And so if you go to buy a new car, okay, that salesman has had tremendous amount of training every single year. Here is our new 
um, you know, in the higher end the car gets, the, the better they're trained. So we'll say a Mercedes salesperson, you know, has, has driven all the competition with a driver, you know, and a, a test driver and shown them the performance difference between uh, a BMW, a Lexus, a Mercedes. And so they can talk about that. Then they, they're extensively trained in all the features where they shine best as opposed to, you know, the competition. And then they're also trained on, okay, the car buyer today is blank. <laughs> they're interested in this, where last year they're interested in performance, this year they're interested in image, or I, I don't know what, but it, it, when you look at that and it's like, okay, our salespeople should not only be trained in the beginning to understand the customer, but annually they should be, they should be brought in and updated and reinvestment in sales. It's like, well, I see building material companies will develop a marketing campaign and they won't bring the salespeople in and brief them on what this campaign is going to do and how they can benefit from it. They just launch it. And it's like, it's like, what a waste of money. So I, I really feel, yeah, they are, many salespeople are out there are selling naked. They're not supported. And to the other point, I think Mark, uh, I can't remember who brought up, but um is with CRM systems, we're, we're measuring activities and not outcomes. Mm -hmm. so I see people in the building materials industry, you, you might want to say uh, selling to architects involve lunch and learns. So you had to do five lunch and learns this week, not did you actually can, did that result in anything? Yeah. So those are my thoughts. One thing I wanted to point out really quick on the marketing side, because I can't help myself. That's what I do. Uh, is you know you're selling naked if you were not digitally experienced, um, digitally ready before COVID hit. So what I mean by that is your website reads like a brochure. It's all about you. It has the wee wee syndrome like we were talking about um, before we went live today. And it's got wee wee all over it instead of you, you, you. So your website is also not functional in, um, first of all, engaging people, earning their trust, earning their awareness. You have no email strategy, no way of communicating regularly. You don't believe in social media and or you dipped a toe and you post once a month. It, it's, it's so fragmented. So what that did was it exposed those weaknesses of your digital game is not strong and unfortunately you know that's that's such a detriment to your salespeople because that's what all those things are there for you know to support them so this was um this is the perfect time and again what many manufacturers that i've spoken with or have as clients decided to do it, during this pandemic was whoosh, pull back we're going to pull back on our marketing. We're going to slow it all down because we don't know. We don't know. And I find that to be um, just an unfortunate choice, not because it's like you're taking away the tools. You're taking away, you're lessening the experience for your customers and for your salespeople. So anyway, what we're going to talk about next is what you can do to make changes. But Chris, you want to jump in? Yeah, I also want to I'm, jump in after Chris. So go ahead. I got a thought on that that that's burning a hole in my pocket. But go ahead, Chris. Sounds good. And and I mentioned it during my intro. I'm a sales guy during my day job, so I think of everything from a sales standpoint. And I want to be. I'll probably be the caboose for most of this week, jumping on the back end of some of these questions because the first thing I wanted to do was listen to what you all had to say. Um, because when it comes to selling naked, you know that that to me that's a term that just as where digital transformation can be a buzzword. I wanted to digest a little bit about what that means. And it, it sounds like there are multiple facets to this. You know, there's not having the proper training, not necessarily listening to customers, being so focused, like you were just saying, Allison, me, me, me versus you, you, you. And I think, you know, from the perspective of a sales guy, when it comes to making sure there's the proper training and making sure we're doing activities that yield outcomes and we're focusing on the outcomes, I think one thing that has drastically changed, and, and we talked about this last week for sure, salespeople need to be better marketers right now. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, as you said, people are already jumping into this 70% to 
through the buying process. And salespeople need to be doing activities, whether it's on email or whether it's through social media, to get that information out there in advance and realize there are tremendous listening capabilities as well on social media that they should be looking for. Because, you know, as you guys see it, you guys do it as well too. I throw videos and content out on a regular basis. I'm on LinkedIn every day, I'm posting something. But what I'm really paying attention for is which posts are getting the comments, which posts are getting people talking, and are the people that are talking and commenting and posting the people that are my ideal clients? And then I look at it from a conversion standpoint. So that's the way I took everything that I just heard and, and I'm putting it together, at least from my perspective as a salesperson. But Ben, I'd like to hear what you have to add too. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. But my challenge is, and this is going back to what Mark Mitchell said and that, you know, what Allison said, we're focusing way too much on digital in some respect, in, in terms of it's a crutch. You know, if we just put a digital strategy in place, life will be fine. You know, if, if we look at the analytics, we're going to know our customer inside, outside, backwards, forwards, and sideways. I mean, what Mark Mitchell said is that, okay, we trained the Mercedes sales guy on this is the trends this year. People care about the color blue or they care about torque or they care about, you know, uh, comfort or they care about luxury. You can't paint people with a brush. Individuals are individuals. People buy from people. People trust people. And if you're not sitting there as a salesperson, actually listening to the person in front of you and actually taking the time to build that level of trust, to understand what's important to them at that moment, you know, where are we going? I mean, the, go back to the car analogy. Nine times out of 10, the woman is the one that is making the final decision on the car because she's the one who's going to be probably driving it the most time. And who do the salespeople focus on? The guy. The man. They focus on the guy nine times out of 10 or 99 times or 100 and start talking about torque and start talking about, you know, horsepower and start talking about, you know, performance and this and that, the other thing where the guy's just sitting there going, is my wife comfortable in this car? Is she going to feel safe? Are my children going to be safe in this car? But the salesperson is so amped up to talk about the features and benefits. And it's not just the sales industry. It goes across every single industry. They're so amped up to talk about and let everybody know everything that they know that they don't take the time to listen to the actual customer and find out what's important to them. And what are the challenges that they're facing? What's making them tear their hair out? And I think that, you know, as much as we rely on analytics and much as we rely on technology, as much as we rely on social media, this, that, the other thing, we need to learn how to listen better. And the problem is sales managers and ops managers and marketing managers and all these types of managers become managers because they were good at a certain task. And because they were good at a certain task, they got promoted to whatever the next level is. Doesn't mean that they know how to teach. Doesn't mean that they know how to, uh, how to motivate. Doesn't mean that they know how to coach. Doesn't know how they mean that they know how to get the best out of a team. It just means that they were there long enough that they got promoted. And that's doing both the salespeople or the, whoever the people are, the team below them a disservice because they don't have somebody who's guiding them properly. And the person who's been promoted is doing it in, from a position of the Peter principle where they're sitting there going, you know what? I am totally and absolutely incapable of doing the job I've been promoted to because nobody's trained me how to actually be a manager or a district manager or a director or a vice president or a C-suite. There's different skills along the way that we all need to learn and we're all selling naked because we don't have the skills that we need to excel at doing what we're doing. And the good news though is Buyers will tell you what they want today. Yes. What they want is a trusted advisor. What they want is something every salesperson has that they probably don't value enough, which is your insights, how you've solved problems for other people just like them. That's what buyers are hungry for. But like we discussed last week, in a one hour meeting with a salesperson, how many minutes do buyers value? I'm just curious what people think. We answered it last week. Five six, minutes. <laughs> six minutes. It's like an arrow through a sales trainer's heart. That's what I do, right? What happened? Well, you're playing feature and benefit bingo and you didn't take the time. You didn't take the time to build the relationship. 
You didn't have good qualifying and discovery questions. So it shouldn't be any shock to anybody that you talked 80% of the time. Good news is take the time to ask your customers what they want, how they want it, and they're going to tell you today more than ever before. Care about your customers. Well, that's called worthy intent. You had the author of that um, on this podcast not too long ago, um, Ed Wallace. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an excellent book. Well, and this all boils down to empathy, right? That, That word's been thrown around so much in the last year, and I think it's become a little ubiquitous, but I think people really don't tune into what it means, and it's everything that we're talking about. So let's jump into question two right? My uh, question that we've had for many people um, prior to this episode was, what do we do about it, right? What do we do if we figure out, you know, shit, we're selling naked, uh, we're marketing naked, same thing. They go hand in hand. What do we do? So if you could take, uh, change one thing about your sales team and approach, what would it be? that would have a big impact on customers. Mark Mitchell, I want you to start. <laughs> wow. I see okay. Turning. It's like, well, I mean, I'm thinking of like 50 things, you know, <laughs> and that's the, that's the problem. And I think the first thing is you have to look at your company and your culture. There certainly is this ideal way to do things, right? But if you don't have a CRM system, okay, you know, uh, you know, it's who you are, how many salespeople are they independent reps? Are they employed by you? What's your structure? What, what is your culture? Right. And it needs to be something that, that you can, that you can, the owner and the leaders can accept and, and not view it as a judgment on their performance or get them defensive, but they see, okay, this makes sense. And to me, I think that there's probably 20 steps you need to take, but you can only take one at a time. And so, and so, so, so the, you know, the first thing in, in my experience is I would spend time educating them about the customer and the customer's needs. Um, that, that's, that's where I would start because I see, uh, and then the second thing I would do is literally develop, I'm going to say, if this is a new customer, not familiar with, with us at all, okay, you know, here is a PowerPoint deck, right, that you're, here's, here's something, a brochure, something that you can walk through uh, that talks about them and not you, right, you know, those would be like that, but there's, it, it, the list goes on, you know, of all the things that they should be doing, but I think they, they have to, one, make sure it fits with who they are as a company, and you, you can't take in something that, that isn't the owners aren't 100% behind and excited about. It won't work. Um, and, uh, and then to me, the missing element, at least in my industry, is understanding the customer. Like what, what is an architect worried about today? Okay. It's different than what I find most salespeople think it is. True. Uh, you know, and they, they go in and, and literally say, well, look, my product is better than what you're using today. Why are you so stupid that you don't shift to it? I mean, it's literally, that's the body language that comes across <laughs> and, and, and they don't step back. And like I always say, they're not looking for a better product. They're looking to solve a problem. Do you know what their problem is? Okay. Cause whatever they're using today is probably working. Okay. And your product isn't that much better that it's worth the risk hassle and, and extra time to, to change to it, right? Because you're not going in with something that's 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better. You know, when Google said, oh, okay, or whoever, you know, the, the uh, you know, classified advertising is free now, you know, just, look, that's 1,000 times better than paying a local newspaper for a classified ad, you know? So that's my thoughts. A long, long one thought. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> But if it's all done in one breath, it's okay. I just have to give him a little. With with your fingers crossed. Right, right. Right. So, Ray, what do you think? What's what's one thing, and I know we all have 50 things we could share with people, but one thing that you think would help our listeners that they could change with their sales and or their marketing? You know, um, not that I don't have original thoughts, but when you hear a good one, you hear a good one. To me, it has to start with uh, either yourself, someone in your organization, or bring in a third party to really listen to your customers and get an understanding of their market. They've changed as well. 
and it, and if you don't have a clear open-minded assessment of what their new needs are and new buying processes are and those things there's no way you're going to be able to align or, or, or train it everything starts with the, with the customer so you know if there if there was one thing find a way to look under the hood and say okay what is it that really makes makes you tick you know what are you most interested in right now how can we align with that and I'm going to ask Mark Roberts to jump in here because I feel like this ties into something that we help clients with quite a bit. And that's kind of, once you understand that going back to basics and taking a look at your value proposition, is it even resonating and current? So is that something you would suggest as a starting point, Mark? Absolutely. Um, if I had to pick one thing, I actually wrote an article for Selling Power Magazine if you only had one thing to do to increase your sales, profit, and market share, what would it be? It would be going out and spending time with your customers. Mm -hmm. And what I really want to caution you with, though, is when I've seen people try to do this themselves, first they tell me, well, my salespeople know my customers, so I don't need to do this. Okay, so if the reason they're not buying from you, like one of the, our clients was a paint company, uh, the reason why professional painters weren't buying were actually the salespeople, uh, over 80%. Uh, when we did the survey. Um, are, is the salesperson going to tell you that? Uh, the other thing is confirmation bias. A lot of times you can't help it. You hear one sentence and it's like, yep, I knew that. And you're going to stop listening. Um, for as long as I've been in sales, which is way too long and we're not going to talk about it, but <laughs> two problems have been in place and buyers are very vocal about it. Salespeople don't listen. And that includes their company. And you don't know the business of my business. Mm -hmm. So what I would recommend is go out, do a value proposition audit. Some of my clients, they tell you what, 80% of my business is about 20 accounts. Great, I've got a product for that. I can get you an answer in seven days. Once you understand what the buyers are saying and feeling and needing, and they'll even share what process they're using, you need to map your sales process to match how they're buying. Um, one of the customer companies I served that I learned so much from was a company called Pragmatic Marketing. And they teach something called Nahito. And again, my martial arts background instantly perked off, right? But what it stands for is nothing important happens in your office. <laughs> they used to sell coffee mugs. And the coffee mug simply said, your opinion, although interesting, is irrelevant. <laughs> I need back, one of those mugs. <laughs> oh, I have one. And even back then, we were promoting use market data. Use your transaction data. Call me crazy. You've got mountains and mountains of data in your server. What is selling in the last month? What's not? Who's your top performer? Why? I mean, this, these aren't things that you have to wonder about or assume. There is data out there, and there are processes to go out and find it. Absolutely. I have a feeling Ben might have a thought and then Chris can be our caboose again. How about that? No, I, I have no thoughts. Uh, <laughs> just like I have no opinions. <laughs> wow. Interesting. What we can yeah, really, yeah, that, that can sell you the Brooklyn bridge. Uh, what we do, and, and I agree with everybody else. It's, it's all about understanding the client. It, it truly is. And then translating that, that information in house in a meaningful way that people can understand it, you know, value it and be able to live it. Uh, you know, what we do with the podcast host for hire is that we run a podcast for companies and we interview strategic partners, vendors, customers, employees, and we get a 360 degree view of the client. And that way we, we get the entire ecosystem because they'll answer questions that I ask that they will never tell a salesperson. I mean, and first of all, a lot of the sales people don't even know how to ask these questions, let alone, you know, listen for the answer. But when you put it all in a podcast and you do it in a, in a you know, very relaxed manner where you're talking to people for over an hour, it's amazing the insight that you can get out of people. It's amazing the, the answers you can get out of people about what, are, what frustrates them, what are the things that they're looking for, what's their aspirations, where are they going as a company, you know, what do they value? And if people and companies take that information, no matter how you get it, 
you know, whether it's using you know, internal people and asking the right questions or hiring somebody externally to go out and survey people, if you can actually take that information, disseminate it, and, you know, really take it to heart and say, you know what, we're doing this and we really should be doing that and make the changes and make sure that everybody inside the company understands what the changes are and why you're changing it and how this is benefiting the company and them. That's where the magic happens because it's, it's not only making sure the customers and you understand the customers, it's making sure the people inside your company understand why you're changing your processes to make things better for the customer. Because if they don't understand the why, they're never going to do it. Absolutely. Yep. Great points. Chris? So when we go back to the original question about, you know, changing one thing to impact your sales today, I think the biggest thing that I've heard from everyone is it's all about listening to the customer. I heard some great things. Mark Mitchell, I love the idea of, you know, having a presentation about your customer that you give to new salespeople. I, I can only imagine how tremendously valuable something like that would have been early in my career. And then Mark Roberts, you know, I, I remember you bringing it up last week, the value prop audit, a great way to get feedback from, uh, from your customers, your top 20 customers, whatever sample size that is you're, you're looking at. And I'm going to get meta real quick because we're all podcasters in some way, shape, or form. And for anyone listening to any of this, a great way to figure out how do I learn more about my customers is listen to how podcasters ask questions. Since you're all, you all have your shows, you know, for anyone that listens to, any, you know, for all the different audiences out there that are listening to us right now, that's a great way to look in and figure out, you know, how can I better understand my customer when I'm in front of them, or I should say when I'm on Zoom these days. I am going to cha change my answer up a little bit and go a slightly different direction in terms of what's one big thing you can do. I think right now it's sales and marketing alignment it is more important than ever, especially because, you know, marketers kind of need to be salespeople right now and salespeople kind of need to be marketers. So especially, and, and I'll reflect on this as someone that works for a large company where you have a lot of resources that are typically either one or another. I think right now it's more culturally important. I think we talked about culture pretty early on. Mark Mitchell, I think it was you that brought it up. But having that culture of going, you know, having that good lead and being able to take that through the CRM process to a salesperson to get that converted into a good opportunity. So that's where I see, if I can think of a big thing right now that would make an impact, and this is me talking to maybe audiences or people with large organizations, especially, um, it's making sure you have that alignment in place to, as we discussed, take these activities and turn them into results, real opportunities and sales. Yes. De-siloing, that's a whole, we could do an entire uh, series just on that alone. So I'm glad you said that because that was going to be my contribution. Um, we've, when we work with a company and we're working on kind of, you know, shoring up their infrastructure in terms of their brand, their value proposition, um, customer personas, and so on. I've had numerous clients who, when I asked, are the sales, is your sales team going to be joining us? And they say, oh, no, we don't need them in here. Ew. And I thought, uh, yeah, <laughs> with sales, you know, there's like this, uh, it's almost like a competition, you know, and I think the companies that I have seen and that I've worked with that, that really started to understand that de-siloing and, and made it a reality, you know, marketing exists to support sales. Sales exists to support the customer. The customer is why we're all here and have a job. So that's just kind of the way I've always looked at it. Um, but Allison, here's the thing we compensate our teams differently. Marketing and sales compensation are completely different. The budgets are, are different. The KPIs are different. The, you know, the language that we use when we're talking to these different departments is different. And because of that, no wonder there's no alignment between sales and marketing because we don't set them up for mutual success if they were both benefited and if they were both compensated based on, you know, sales, based on, comp you know, on how, you know, employees or sorry, and how accounts grow, 
those type of things, then I think there would be far better alignment. But the problem is because they have different budgets, because they have different, you know, compensation plans, because they have different everything, that leads to the animosity between the two of them. And that's why they don't talk well to each other. And that's why they don't play well together. Well, yeah, that, and I think leadership, leadership. Oh, leadership is all part of it. Exactly. Um, we are coming to the end and I'm, we were going to talk about, I think some of the constraints holding you back, but I think more importantly, we should end with how do you actually leverage data since that was the whole crux of our uh, conversation today. How do you actually leverage it so that you can stop selling naked? Um, you know, what data set should you be looking at? And then how do you turn that data into dollars? So let's start there. Um, I, I think we should start with Mark Roberts on that. Yeah, the way I, I've been doing it, and again, I'm not claiming, you know, it's the only way, uh, but I look at three data sets. Number one, your transaction data. There's a lot of key information in there and make sure that you don't require your salespeople to become librarians to understand it, right? Yeah. Take the data, turn it into dashboards that is, um, you know, prescriptive. Um, it it kind of guides the salesperson into how to grow opportunities. Number two, definitely do the voice of your customer. I, I can't emphasize that enough. It sounds like a broken record, but it's been so valuable um, for the companies that I've served. Uh, one of which, you know, they made handicap vans. Uh, they help people in wheelchairs drive again. It was one of my favorite markets I've ever served. And when I asked the company, why do people buy your vans? Well, it's the most technically advanced van in the industry. So I spent three months back then out meeting with people in wheelchairs and I asked them, why did you buy it? Well, it's the quietest van in the industry. What? <laughs> it's the quietest. He said, you know, handicapped vans have been around for a while, but everybody puts the ramp in the door and when I'm driving, it rattles. I can't even listen to the radio. Yours is the quietest van in the industry. Bingo. I never got that insight from any of their executives. I didn't even get it from their dealers. But when we started promoting that in the marketplace, oh. that company, I want to say we grew 50 million in six years with a 6% increase in profit, right? And then wow. the third data set is if most sales teams haven't been trained, why don't we figure out what their skill set is? And I love to do top performer analysis. Let's all get on the same page of what a top performer is, find three, four of those people, assess what skills they all have in common, and then basically clone them. Let's get the rest of the team up to those levels. That's what I call uh, prescriptive training as well. So again, with those three data sets, very quickly, we're gonna be able to develop a plan no matter what kind of market you're in. Yeah, I love that. Hey, Chris, you wanna jump in here? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one because it's actually, my last answer is a segue to this around having that cultural alignment between sales and marketing. Because I, I do think this is where, and, and I'm, I'm lucky because I get to work with a number of different customers. And yes, I you know primarily talk about automation equipment, but the reality is I get to learn a lot about their business challenges as well. And it's taking leads you know from the marketing group and bringing those into the sales group and having those convert into something successful i mean we're hearing it even more right now because virtual trade shows are a new thing we don't necessarily know how to do them yet so people are looking really closely at what type of measurable measurable results what type of leads am i getting from a trade show so if i were to attack this one again from the perspective of a salesperson i'm going to be looking at it from amp you know what is marketing doing to bring in relevant leads? What are the ones that are helping me most, you know, convert them into opportunities that I can pursue and then turn into a closed order at that point? And then have a, a you know, it's important to have a feedback loop in that process as well. Whether it's a good lead or a bad lead, you can go back and start learning and figuring out, hey, are the things I'm doing at a trade show pulling in good leads? Are my digital assets bringing in good leads? What do I need to tweak to improve that quality? Because then it becomes a bit more of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you keep making those little adjustments, then you're getting better leads to the salespeople. They're getting more opportunities. They're giving more feedback because they understand the process at that point. So that's my thought. I, I what, Literally, whenever I think of this topic, I'm only thinking in terms of what is convertible into something that I might be able to sell. Yeah. 
I, I want Mark Mitchell to jump in here. Special what, what, what I find uh, in my industry I serve is that people either they cherry pick data that looks favorable. Like, look how many likes we got on, on this. Look how many shares. Look at our Google Analytics. Look at, you know, we won an award. And so they cherry pick favorable things. And I always say to them, and then they're overwhelmed with data. They, they, it's like there's so much data that you can get today that they, they just kind of, well, that looks like a good data point. That looks like one, sure, okay. And I always say, okay, so somebody comes in with a plan. We're going to grow sales 10% this year with this product line to this market. Okay, that's great. And here's our plan. And then I say, okay, how will we measure your results? What's the data points for measuring your results? And then we don't lose sight of that. We stay focused on it. And even if you don't achieve your goal, you learn something from failure. And so we're, we're afraid of failure. And today with digital things, you can try things all day long. You can change the headline on your website and, and, and see, did it do any better? You know, in the old days when I would do direct mail for companies, we always were A-B testing. Mm -hmm. We always had, this is the benchmark. Can you beat that? But I don't see companies trying to do that with their either website or their calls to action or just different things. So I want always the data to be aligned to a goal. Like we're going to do this and the measure of success is, is how we're gonna measure it. And every month I'm gonna come in and report to you. And whether it's bad news or good news or mediocre news, but that, that to me is the best way to use data. Ben, what do you think? The thought that's going through my mind from over 30 years of this is garbage in, garbage out when it comes to data. The majority of salespeople know 5% of what the CRM can do, realistically, <laughs> at, at the best. I mean, if you take a look at Microsoft Word today, the average user uses somewhere between 3 and 7% of what the software can do. It's the same for CRM. It's the same for everything. And the reason is we don't understand it. And when the sales reps don't understand why they need to fill out information a certain way and the benefits that how it's going to benefit them by filling out information correctly. And if they only perceive that by filling out this information, it gives somebody a reason to micromanage them. They're just going to fill it out in a way that they know is going to CYA. You know, it's just going to cover their ass. And I see this time and time again with people that sit there and say, you know what, I'll just fill it out in a way that it's good at, as I say, the cherry picking the data. You know, they want me to do this, fine, we'll put that information in there. They want to know this, fine, we'll put that in there. Whether it's true, whether it's not true, whether it's, you know, whether it makes sense, whether it doesn't make sense, because they don't see how they can turn around and look at that data six months from now and have more intelligent ways for them to have long-term conversations with their clients in order to benefit their checkbooks and be able to grow their bank accounts. So when we train our salespeople as to what the benefit is of the CRM, not only to the organization, but to them as well, and how to use that data to be able to make them more effective within an account, we're doing that. But, you know, somebody told me the other thing is the annual strategic plan, which is based built on data, 60 to 70% of the people in the organization will never see that information. They may see a, a one pager, they may see a dashboard, they may get an annual meeting where they'll talk about it for 10 minutes. But nobody sees the strategic plan that's based on that data. And if people don't understand how that data is being used, what decisions are being made, how that data affects them, they're not going to care. And if they don't care, the data that the, the data sets that are being created are going to be garbage in garbage out. Yep. <clears throat> Ray, you want to finish it off? Anybody ever changed mobile phone carriers or, or insurance companies? <laughs> you, you know why you did it? Be because they treat the new customers better than the existing customers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I haven't run across a client or a company yet that didn't have another 20% plus worth of profitable upside in a customer base they already had because they were making assumptions that the new one was the magic silver bullet that was going to take them somewhere. I've had companies where when you just start doing some simple Google research on customers they already have, by whatever me measure 
you determine that this is a good customer or we have a long-standing relationship or they seem they seem to give us a lot if you just do some research and find out i need to know more about this customer we talked about this earlier if you did a presentation that was just about that customer and them do that for yourself if for no other reason i've seen clients uncover the fact that their major customer had divisions and subsidiaries they didn't know about you've already got a vendor number who's calling on them that they had uh, similar or almost like products uh, that were about like what you know the client produced or with some small adjustments and modifications could also support who was who was pursuing that you know so I, I, again especially in times like this where you want to move the needle now there's a lot of gold in what you have right now and it doesn't require uh, as we said a rocket surgeon uh, to go in and do some very basic uh, analysis of what you already have. And then there's the knock-on effect. And I, I've had this happen, you know, myself, where when you go back to that customer and say, hey, I've been doing some homework and here's what I see. And by the way, we've decided to make you one of our preferred customers. You know, so now you're part of, you know, we value you so much. We really want to listen. And just by acknowledging you're paying attention to them, you'd be shocked at what happens. So from a, you know, what are you going to do about it now? Where are you going to leverage data? Start with what you have. You're, you're not at a, at a zero, zero uh, datum here. You've got more than you think you do. Start with who, who you already love and who loves you back and, and see if you can do some more. Yeah, no, that is fantastic advice. And that's, I think the way I would um, surmise all this is do the most with what you have because trust me, there's a lot being left on the table, right? And uh, this isn't going to take um, this isn't going to take spending a million dollars on any kind of fancy marketing campaign. It's not going to take it's going to take less than what you think it will. But if you think outside the box and make some adjustments, this this is the this is normal now. It's never going to go back to the way it was. So you know, prepare, you're only going to prepare yourself so that the next time the tide goes out and it will, uh, you won't be, you know, you won't be selling naked. So we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for everybody that tuned in today. And we are going to talk next week. Part three is going to be reducing risk to make sales easier because who yeah. did that? We're going to help you find ways to make it easier to find you, to buy from you, and to share the experience. And while earning trust and attention uh, at the same time, making that easier. So until then, keep showing up, keep working together. You are a game changer.